right, well, praise the Lord. Good to be with you tonight. <clears throat> yeah, amen. Hey, you know, they were talking about, I think it was on the news sometime today about having the, uh, they're having the Feast of Tabernacles over in Israel right now. And uh, Israel's holding up signs uh, about, you know, with the current administration, how Trump is so pro-Israel. By the way, that pleases the Lord. I want you to know that. And uh, they were saying, make Israel great again, you know, talking about how Trump is pro-Israel. And, uh, you know, we know it's the Lord going to do it, but, hey, it's a good thing. We got an administration in there that, that loves uh, uh, God's people. And God said he'll bless us for blessing them. And I believe that. You know, I just take it for what it says. And so uh, I think that's a good thing. So we need to pray for them. And, uh, you know, uh, I was mentioning this last night. We had a revival over in, the, in Lehigh there and preached in it. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm all for these capital connections going up and, and getting a witness to our, our uh, political leaders. And I think that's a good thing. But, you know, revival is not going to start at the White House. Amen. Amen. Um, I'm all for people that go to prison ministries, and uh, man, I like prison. I, we, you need to, we need to reach some prisoners, men and women in prison, because the answer is Jesus Christ, amen? And, uh, but it's not going to start in the big house. Revival is going to start in God's house, and that's where judgment's got to begin. It's got to begin right here, and uh, you know, I was looking at some, somebody had said, uh, you know, uh, talking about public school system. And they were talking about, you know, some of the things that's going on in the public school system. I don't know if it's going on in Lee County, but up in North Florida, did you know the teachers cannot say boys and girls? It's non-gender up there. And I'm talking about these are little towns, and they're not allowed. My niece is a teacher, been up there. Well, she's not a teacher now, but she's, she trains the teachers. And they cannot use boys and girls. They've got to use students because of the non-gender push that they're pushing in the school system. And, uh, and somebody had said, you know, what about the things that are going on in the school system? And I forget who made a, made a comment. Uh, but, you know, really, technically, the government has no say over the public schools. They should not. You read the Tenth Amendment. They're not supposed to be involved in. Anytime the government gets involved in things, it messes it up. And, uh, and did you know this? And, I've, and I thought this a long time. Uh, did you know that the... That the um, uh, the Supreme Court did not say that you cannot teach Bible in the public school. But guess what happened? The Christians took that and ran with it. And then they kind of said, okay, well, we'll just bow down uh, to what the, the Supreme Court said. And, uh, and now, did you know what? It's still, you look at all the court records, you can go into a public school and they can teach creation out of a Bible. Now, I don't know about as far as sharing the gospel, but it's still allowed. But the ACLU picked up on that thing, and they shut us down. And Christians let that happen. Churches let that happen. Some of that responsibility is going to fall at the steps of the churches. And you watch what happens when we stand before the Lord. And, uh, but anyhow, that's enough of that. I'm glad the Lord's still on the throne tonight, aren't you? Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, if you have your Bible, how many of you got your Bible tonight? Raise it up. Okay, all right. Praise the Lord. I like to see that. And uh, go over to Numbers, if, uh, I'm sorry, Joshua chapter number 22. Joshua chapter 22. And uh, I want to share a thought here with you tonight. And uh, from the book of Joshua, just going to read one verse now for our text, and we'll pray and then ask the Lord to bless in it. But I want to, you know, I, I was studying through uh, some of the Old Testament not too long ago, and I, I come along here, Brother Rod, and I was looking through Joshua. You know, Joshua is, is, is the name Joshua, the Old Testament name is the New Testament is Jesus. And what a great parallel uh, remember, Moses was a picture of the law. Remember, he couldn't take him into the promised land. Guess who does? Jesus takes you in. The law can't get you to heaven. Jesus gets you to heaven. And uh, what a picture that is. But, but here, I was reading along, and I come up here in this chapter, and I look down at the last verse. That's where I want you to go, verse 34. Joshua 22, verse 34. And, uh, and it says this. I want to read this verse to you. We'll make reference to others in this chapter and uh, bring some other things in. But for the sake of time, I just want to read this verse for our text. It says, And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad called the altar, what? Ed. Ed. For it shall be a witness between us that the Lord is God. 
Now, I don't know about you, but knowing the Hebrews and the way they make names, did you know they'll use 17 letters with one vowel for a name? And some of those names, they, they put some of the hardest names that you can read in the Hebrew. And, and this isn't the first time there's a named altar. Uh, I got to look and I thought, well, this is kind of strange. They named this altar. Well, there was three other times that there's a named altar. But all three times they use the name Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Shalom. And they had God in the middle of that altar. Now, if you're named Ed, Ed is a wonderful name. I'm not picking on the name Ed. But it just shocked me to see, Brother Tim, that that just the altar named Ed. But you know what? I've learned this. It's just like the things are in this whole world. Sometimes uh, things aren't always what they seem. And until you really start looking at something, did you know God wants us to be discerning people? He wants us to know what's going on. He, he doesn't want us just to take things at face value. He wants us to use this book to compare the things that are going on in this whole world. And when we'll do that, that'll keep us going right down the line we need to go. This Bible right here, this book, will keep us on the right track. God's Word will do that. Father, we love you tonight. We're thankful now for the word of God. Help us to, tonight, Lord. We pray for all the different requests that have been mentioned. Pray you'd bless them. Lord, thank you for the heart of this church to pray for people. And Lord, we know that, that it's going to touch heaven. It's going to impact. God, you told Paul, as he mentioned to Philemon, through his prayers, you're going to get something accomplished. So, Lord, help us to realize our prayers matter in the scheme of eternity. Thank you, Lord, for what's going to happen in all these prayer requests that's been prayed for tonight. Lord, we know it's because of what you're doing. We know it's because you're on the throne tonight. We know it's because, God, you have the power to do these things. And we'll thank you and we'll praise you. Bless now in this service. Thank you for the word of God. Bless it. Speak at our hearts with it now. Draw us unto thyself. And then if there's someone in this building tonight, they do not know Christ as their personal Savior, we pray that this would be the time, this night, that they'd come to know Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior. And Lord, we'll be sure to give you the praise now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. An altar named Ed. And, uh, you know, I was, I was going through that thing, and I thought, you know what? This is a strange text in the Bible. And, you know, I was looking at that thing, and, and really until you get back into the chapter a little bit more, you really don't see what's going on. And, uh, and when I was looking at that thing, I was thinking, you know what, uh, there, there's more to this than, than meets the eye when you first look at it. And, you know, it's kind of like when you look at, at some churches. You know, you know some churches, they, they call themselves a church, but, you know, really, they're not really a church. I mean, they're a call, they're an assembly, people are assembling, but there's no gospel message being preached. There's no, there's no soundness in it. Uh, and many times they're just meeting there and, and it's just a, a form of religion. It's a form of godliness, but it denies the power thereof. And, uh, and there's a lot of that going on. Did you know that in this city tonight? In fact, most of them tonight that are like that probably don't even have their doors open tonight. And that's probably a good thing. Because they wouldn't have the truth being taught if they did, right? But, but there's a lot of that going on. And so you say, well, that's a church. Well, is it really? Is it really God's church? You know, and you think about that. Hey, there's a lot of that in, in, the, in the different perversions of the Bible. Uh, you know, until you really look at them and you start studying, you start seeing what the differences are, you might think, man, they're just the same as a King James Bible. They're not the same. There's a lot of differences. There's, there's a lot of errors and a lot of things that they've done. And, uh, and the big thing that gets me is when you put a copyright on something, you're saying that's yours. Yeah. Hey, they're copyrighted. This one's not. Thank God for that. It's God's word. You don't copyright God's word. But if you copyright something, you're saying, hey, that's mine. And uh, that right there tells me there's money. They're making money on these things. It's a money thing. And, uh, and then even, even ministers, even preachers today, You've got to be careful because uh, even Jesus said there's going to be many that will come in that day. And they're going to say, Lord, we preached in your name and we prophesied in your name and we cast out demons in your name. And Jesus is going to say to him, hey, I didn't know you. I don't know you. Depart from me. And, uh, and so just because somebody says they're a preacher, you've got to be careful and understand, do they line up with this book right here? 
That's what Paul said. Hey, he said if somebody comes and preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. And, uh, and so we've got to understand things aren't always the way they seem. But we're called to discern the truth. That's why he told that church over in Revelation. He said, hey, you have, he, you've studied them folks out and you've realized that they are not truly apostles. And he said, for that I commend you. Why? Because they discerned the truth. But you know what? There's a lot of that going on, and we need to be aware of that. And we also need to be aware tonight that in our own hearts, we can't even trust our own hearts sometimes. Did you know that? Did you know our heart tonight, my heart, it, you know, it's bent on doing things that it shouldn't do. And it's bent on having its own way. It's bent on doing uh, the things that would maybe be opposed to the Lord. And, and if we let our own heart guide us, You've got to be very careful. That's why, again, we need this book tonight. So when I was looking at this, I was thinking, you know, here's some things that we ought to consider tonight when we look at this text. And I want you to consider it as we look at it. First of all, I'll give you these points. Number one, I want to see tonight a dangerous compromise. Anytime we compromise on the word of God or on the things of God, we're on dangerous ground. Compromise is not a good thing. Now, if, if you say, well, okay, how about if I compromise with my wife? She wants to go eat this tonight, and I'll compromise. That's different. You better do that, right? <laughs> but I'm talking about on the things of God. Don't compromise your convictions on the word of God. And it's happening a lot. And then we see not only a dangerous compromise, but we also see a damaging communion. Did you know who we run with can affect our lives? You know, I, I, some of these teenagers come in here, and, and, uh, and I, you know what? I, in fact, it, it does, it's not just teenagers that get caught up in dangerous communions, get, get with the wrong crowd. Uh, did you know I can prophesy to you? I'm not a prophet, but I, I'm just saying I can tell you what you'll be tomorrow by who you run with today. Because did you know that can drag you down? It can take you down. And then not only do we see that, we'll also notice tonight, I want you to consider this, and that is this deceptive commitment. So let's look at these three things tonight, and I want you to consider them with me, and let's let the Lord speak to our hearts. First of all, this dangerous compromise. When you look at this story, I want you to back up with me and go back just a few verses and look with me down at verse number 24 of this same chapter and chapter 22 of Joshua. And I want you to notice what that says here. And again, you'll notice that there's really, there's two tribes, two and a half tribes. It's Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh that's doing this altar named Ed. They were all three, two and a half tribes. They were all three involved in this thing. And you say, well, Brother Stan, that looks like a good thing. They've made this altar, and, and they called it Ed. And, uh, and right away, I want to think about that horse, you know, Mr. Ed. I always think about him. But I'm thinking, you know what? They made an altar, and it's going to be an altar for the Lord. But you know what? When you start looking at this thing, it wasn't a good thing. And we see here in verse 24, notice what it says here. Well, actually, back up to verse 23. And, uh, and it says, and we have built us an altar to turn from following the Lord. Now, what they're saying here is the other tribes come and they say, you know what? What you've done is wrong. You've made an altar, and that's going to cause you to turn from the Lord. That's what they were saying in this verse. So you got to watch that. And it says this, And he knoweth, and Israel shall know, if it be in rebellion or if it be in transgression uh, against the Lord, save us not this day. In other words, they're saying, look, if this what we're doing is rebellious, then we don't want the Lord. We're, we're, we're happy for you to come in and overtake us. See what they were going to do. They were going to war against these two and a half tribes. Because they knew what they were doing. It didn't appear right to them. And, uh, and so they're here and they says this. It says in verse 23. He says that if we have built us an altar to turn from following the Lord. Or if to offer thereon burnt offering or meat offering. Or if it to offer peace offering thereon. Let the Lord himself require it. And if we have not rather done it for fear of this thing, saying, now here's what they say. Now watch this. In time to come, here's what we're going to say. In time to come, your children might speak unto our children, saying, what have ye to do with the Lord God of Israel? Now that may not make sense until you realize where they're at in relationship to the promised land. 
if you go back over, now hold that place right there because we're going to come right back. And go back with me over to Numbers, if you will, and Numbers chapter number 32, and we'll see an expl explanation of this. And, uh, and now we're going to kind of see where this compromise starts, okay? And it says in verse number 1 of Numbers 32. Now watch this. Now the children of Reuben, Numbers 32, I'll let you get there. I hear pages turn. I want you to see this. Numbers 32, verse 1. Now the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of cattle. These folks were ranchers. And they had, they had gotten these cattle, you know, as they come through and out of the wilderness. And they build up this big cattle ranch. And, uh, and they've got this big multitude of cattle. By the way, be very careful that your blessing doesn't turn your heart away from the blesser. See, God can bless you, but that blessing can become a curse if it turns your heart away from the Lord. Got to watch it. And, uh, and so they said, hey, it says, and when they saw, always watch that in the Bible. Remember, it was what, it was what Lot saw, the well-watered plains of Jordan, when he chose to pitch his tent towards Sodom. He was looking at it through these eyes and not through his heart. So watch what you see. It'll get you. And it says, They saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, that behold, the place was a place for cattle. Now, I don't know how they didn't know that it wasn't a place for cattle on the other side of Jordan. Because remember, that's where God wanted them to go. He wants to take them into what we call the promised land, right? And here's what they're saying. They said, look, Moses, we're here. We like this. This is a place for cattle. And the children, look at verse 2, And the children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spake unto Moses and to Eliezer the priest and unto the princes of the congregation, saying uh, these different names, and I'm not, I'm not going to read those to you because I probably can't pronounce them, but he says this in verse 4, Even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel is a land for cattle, and thy servants have cattle, like, like he didn't know that. Wherefore, said they, If we have found grace in thy sight, let this land be given unto thy servants for a possession, and watch this, and bring us not over Jordan. That's bad. Why is that bad? Because they're not doing it for the Lord's interest. They're not doing it because God wanted them to. They're doing it to please themselves. And you know what they're really doing, Brother Rod? They're stopping short of the full blessing that God had for them. They're settling for second best. Did you know any time we compromise on something God wants us to do, and we say, you know what, I'm just satisfied with this right where I'm at. Did you know what we're doing? And we know that God wants to take us in further. You know what we're doing? We're settling for the less than what God's best is for our lives. Hey, I don't know about you, but I don't want to do that. I've done that enough. And I don't want to miss the blessing of God. Listen, I believe you're here tonight because you want God to bless you. And you want all that God has for you, right? That's what we should want. We should want everything God has for us. And we're here tonight, Lord, because we want that. Well, guess what? If we compromise and we say, you know what? I'm just satisfied with being right here. Because I see this place, oh, it looks so good, and I'll tell you what, and you know what? You've got to be careful. You know what God's going to do? He's going to let them have it. Be careful. Have you ever prayed for something and God gave it to you and you realize, man, I wish the Lord had never given me that? <laughs> I, listen, we ought to run 10 laps around here and thanking the Lord that he hasn't always given us everything we wanted. Because if we would have, we'd have, listen, we'd be in a real mess tonight. But he, he lets them have that. And you know what? <clears throat> Here's the thing. Guess where they're at now when you get over to Joshua? They're on that side. And so what they're saying is there's going to come a time later on when their children that are in the promised land, our children are going to try to say we know the Lord, but they're going to say you don't have any part with us because you don't come here. You're not in there. Hey, it's kind of like the people that just show up here sporadically every now and then. Did you know what? They're missing out on the blessing that God has for them. I've 
heard preachers say, well, you know, they'll come into a church. Maybe they were gone for a week or something, and they've been, been gone to a meeting. They'll come back in. There'll be somebody there, and they'll say, hey, good to have you folks. And people will say, well, hey, wait a minute. They, they, they're adamant. They, they come here. Well, they're never here when I'm here. Hey, listen. Hey, folks, listen. You've got to be a part of it. You got to be where God wants you to be. You're going to miss out on the blessing if you stop short of where God wants you. And that's what they were saying. Listen, there's going to come a time when your children are going to say, "We don't know who you are. We don't know what you're about. We don't." Hey, hey, don't get mad at somebody that says, "Hey, do you know the Lord?" When you don't live like a Christian, right? right. Hey, don't hey, don't get mad at somebody if they say, "Hey, you need you need to get saved," and, and you're living a life that doesn't show that you're a Christian. Don't get mad about that. Because, you, hey, listen, our lives ought to show that we know Jesus Christ. Amen. And we ought to have a life that, that exemplifies him. And, uh, and, and that's, why this, that's where this started. By the way, guess what's going to happen? And uh, this is about 1,000 B.C. In about 721, guess who's going to come in and take the northern tribes captive? The Assyrians. Remember that? You can read about it over in 2 Kings. Guess who's going to be the first ones that get attacked? Reuben and Gad, because they're on the wrong side of the river. That's where they're going to come through. Hey, did you know what? You're setting yourself up for the attack of the enemy if you stop short of where God wants you to be. Amen. The enemy, you're setting yourself up. Hey, the enemy's going to come through there, and guess who's going to get the full brunt of that assault when they come in? Reuben and Gad. And that half tribe of Manasseh. Why? Because they weren't where God wanted them to be. And when you aren't where God wants you to be, listen, you skip out on church, you stay home, watch whatever's on TV, and by the way, there's nothing on worth watching. I'll tell you that right now. And there ain't anything out there in this world that's worth missing church for and missing the things of God. And when you miss it, guess what? You're setting yourself up for the enemy to get a foothold in your life. Every time... I've seen it. I've seen folks do it. And you've seen it happen in your own life. And any time you miss and you stop short of where God wants you to be, hey, it's a dangerous compromise. Well, let me move on. And we could spend more time there. And, uh, and that's going to happen as the Assyrians come in. Uh, that's that dangerous compromise. Number two, I want you to notice this damaging communion. I got to thinking about this, Brother Steve. Did you know Reuben and Gad are almost totally opposite in their character? Now, if I went through and I preached some years ago on the different tribes and these different boys, and you can find some of this and how their character is going to be and what they're going to be like back over in Genesis chapter number 49. If you go there with me, I'll show you this, try to be quick. This is where Jacob is getting ready to go home to be with the Lord. And, of course, he's the, he's the daddy. And he brings all these boys in just before to his deathbed, as it were. And he's going to tell them. And these things that he's going to mention about each one of these boys, they are a picture of what they are like in their character. Because remember, these are the boys. But their, their offspring, their tribe, their, their, their different uh, ones that come out of them are going to be like them. Isn't that amazing? What we are many times our offspring is. Got to be careful. If you don't live for the Lord, guess what? Don't expect your children to do that. If we want our children to live for God and serve God, hey, we need to do that. Now, it doesn't mean they can't go astray, but I'll tell you what, we need to be an example as parents, and that's, that's an important thing. But here, the, these guys were totally opposite. Look at what uh, Jacob, as he begins to talk about Reuben, in verse number 4. Well, verse 3. Look at verse 3. It says, Reuben... He said, thou art my firstborn, my might, the beginning of my strength, the excellency of my dignity, the excellency of my power. I can imagine old Reuben, can't you? I, I, can you imagine Reuben? He, I mean, he's getting excited. Oh, daddy's going to bless me. Man, look at all these great things that he's saying about me. And it's like he hangs the, 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 uh, uh, the thing on him, you know, uh, the metal, like a metal on him. And, and look what he says in verse 4. He's just getting ready to take it off unstable as water. Thou shalt not excel because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defilest thou it, he went up to my couch. Now, remember what Reuben did. 
He said, Reuben, you're a great big old boy. He said, you've got potential. You're strong. But he said, you're as weak as water. You know what water does? Water runs downhill. He said, you've got a, you've got a propensity to go downward, not upward. He said, water, where, whatever it goes in, what does it do? It takes the shape of whatever it's in. He said, Reuben, no matter where you're at, whoever you're with, you just get like them. You become like them. He said, you don't control people. He said, you don't make them better. He said, you just get to be like they are. You're like water. You're unstable as water. He said, Reuben, he said, not only that, you went in and slept with one of my wives. Reuben, he said, there's something wrong with you. There's something terribly wrong with you, Reuben. Now, see, that's Reuben's character. And you wonder, how could he get with Gad? Now, look at Gad here in verse number 19. Verse number 19, he says, Gad, a troop shall overcome him but he shall overcome at the last. Gadite, the Gadites were some of the fiercest warriors you'd ever come across. In fact, there's a time over there where David is talking about the Gadites, and he says that one Gadite is as good as a hundred men. That's the least of, that's the runt of the litter of a Gadite is as good as a hundred men, and one good one is as good as a thousand men. That's how tough these guys were. These were the type of guys that if you got them down, they weren't going to stay down. You'd better kill a Gadite because if you don't, he's getting back up and he's going to do you in. Now, what does he picture? He pictures that Christian that says, you know what? Nothing's going to stop me. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm, I may not, listen, I may not have all I need to do it, but I'm going to do it by God's grace, by God's power. He said, I'm going to stay in there. I'm going to hang in there for God. I'm going to be like a pit bull. I'm going to get a hold of the things of God, and you're not going to turn me loose. You can knock me down, but he said, I'm getting back up, and I'm going to serve the Lord with my whole life. Amen. And you'd wonder, how could a Gadite, and a Reubenite that's unstable as water get together. And I got to thinking, did you know when you go back over there and you study where those tribes camped, guess where those tribes camped? It was Reuben and Gad and Simeon was right there with them. Now Simeon's going to be a terrible, he's one of them ones, you look at him and his life is going to be a mess. But Reuben and Gad, they camped together they ate together. They went here together. They talked together. And what happened? Listen. Have you ever seen that it's very hard when a Christian gets with somebody that they shouldn't hang out with? Did you know what almost always happens? The person that's not living for God will take them down. Yeah. You ever seen that? Yeah. Listen. I hardly ever will the Reubenite come up to be a Gadite, but a Reubenite, a Gadite, can be pulled down and be drawn down. Listen, I've heard people say, well, I'll couple with that person and I'll make them strong in the Lord. Did you know what happens? That doesn't happen. That's why God says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Why? Because they'll drag you down. They'll take you down. Listen, Brother Oscar, I can illustrate that. Brother Oscar, come up here. This guy's strong. I know he is. I can tell by looking at him. Come up here, Brother Oscar. Now, I don't want to get down too far because I want you to get back. See if it's gonna be easier for me to pull you down than you pull me up. <laughs> see, see, now this guy's strong. There's no doubt about it. He dragged me down in a heartbeat. Do you know what? It's easier for me on this down being down here to pull him down than it is for him to pull me up. Amen. And that's what they did. They got in there with that crowd, they got hanging out with them Ruben Ice, they got hanging out with us, and they took him down, and next thing you know, the Gadites had lost the power of God. And they were settling for the second best. Thank you, brother. Hey, did you know what? It'll happen every time. I've told teenagers, I've told older folks, listen, it, you get to hanging and running with the wrong crowd, and you, you join up with the wrong person, you get in, in, in an unequally yoked marriage or whatever it might be, and it'll drag you down. And that's what happened. Hey, they, they got a hold of these things, and they got a hold of that, that, that philosophy, if you will. And by the way, Fast forward about 1,200 years. The Assyrians are going to come in. That's one enemy. Guess where you find the maniac when Jesus gets off the ship? He's called the maniac of what? 
the Gad era could be, I can't prove it, but I really believe, and guess what they're raising, Brother Rod? They weren't raising cattle. It was hogs. Your cattle will turn to pigs when you get out of the will of God. Now, I'm not against hogs, and I like ribs, and I like all that stuff. But you know what I'm saying tonight? In a spiritual sense, hey, your gold over in the Old Testament turned to brass because they didn't obey God. Hey, the things of God, those, those, that treasure that God's given you and have given you. Hey, listen, you start throwing that in before the swine and you start giving that to the world and you start yielding your life to the devil. Guess what? You're going to lose your life. Amen. You're going to lose your ability to serve God. You're going to lose the power of God in your life. Hey, their cattle turned to hogs. And not only that, de demonic possession, you could say that. To the old devil got a foothold in them. So you got that that's going on. By the way, somebody said this. The strength of Gad is a reminder that an unguarded strength is a double weakness. Now you think about that. You may have a strength and you may be strong physically and you may have you may be head and shoulders and you may be the, the one that somebody would say, hey, that person is the shoe in for whatever we've got to do. Do you know what? If that, that person's not sold out to God and they've not yielded that strength to the Lord and they haven't, haven't uh, uh, submitted that to the Lord Jesus Christ, did you know what? That strength, that unguarded strength becomes a double weakness in their lives. Because the old devil, listen, the old devil doesn't have to get you by making you do something bad in the flesh. He can get you by making you do something good in your flesh. And when you do something good in your flesh, guess what? Look at what I do. And you're just about this far from a fall when we get that way. Listen, and that, I'm sure that them Gadites were probably thinking that. And so we see that dangerous compromise. We see the damaging communion. But number three, I want you to see this deceptive commitment. In verse 10, would you go back to verse 10 of Joshua 22? Let's go back over to our text. I don't think we'll go any ways where else, but... Just look at Joshua 22 and verse 10. I'll try to move quickly here. But look at verse 10. It says, notice in verse 10. And when they came unto the borders of Jordan that are in the land of Canaan. Joshua 22 verse 10. I'll let you get a second to get there. It says, and when they came unto the borders of Jordan that are in the land of Canaan. The children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by Jordan. Now you under underline this phrase. A great altar to see to. Now, you say, well, what, what's wrong with that, Brother Stan? I mean, we ought to have things in our lives that people can see that we know the Lord. And we believe that. We ought, people ought to see God and, and Christ in our lives. And, and we, ought to, we ought to look right and, and dress right and be right for the Lord and be a good testimony. But wait a minute. This was just, this was an example of having profession without possession. Yeah. Amen. It was like that church over there, I believe it was Sardis, and it says that you have a name that you live, but you're dead. See, people said, man, that's a lively church. That church has got something going on. Man, they're excited. But you know what? That don't always mean that they're alive. Mm -hmm. Because God said, you've got a name that you live, but you're dead. See, it matters what God says about us. Not what we say or what somebody else said. Hey, by the way, guess who, guess who, guess who was always, and the Lord said, listen, you, listen, you can do the things that they're doing because they're, they're, obey, they're trying to live by the law. But he said, the Pharisees are doing the things that they do to be seen of men. And he says it over and over. Let me ask you, are you just doing, and am I just doing what we do to be seen of people? See, so you got to be careful about that. That's one of the things that the judgment seat is going to reveal our motives behind. Listen, did you know there's been a lot of great men, and I'm talking about good preachers, that have been taken down because they got this big shot mentality? They did. It, it happened. I'm talking about good preachers. I could name them. I'm not going to do that. But I'm telling you, it happens. That is why we've got to have our hearts humble to God all the time. Listen, he told that one, that one uh, king over there, he said, I, and I think it was Uzziah, 
I, he said, you know what? You're a good king. You had your heart turned to me. But he said, when you were small, then were you big. You know what he was talking Amen. about? Because his heart, he had this heart where I need God. I can't do it without you, God. And then all of a sudden, he gets a big head. Oh, I don't need God. And we've got to be careful about that. Because there's not one of us in here. There's not a preacher in America. There's not a, a church in America that doesn't need God. Amen. We need the Lord in everything that we do. Because without him, we can do nothing. As Matthew 6, verse 1, he said, Take heed that you do not your alms before men, so to be seen of them. Verse 5, he said that they may be, he said the Pharisees stand and they pray. They're hypocrites. He said they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Matthew 23, verse 5, but all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge their borders of their garments. They wanted people to say, man, look at that person. Look at them. They got to be a spiritual person. Yeah. But they were doing it to be seen. We must be careful, this old flesh of ours, to be seen of men. We call that the pride of life. That's one of those, the, the, the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. That's what took Eve down. That's what will take us down if we're not careful. It's the same. The devil don't have to change his tactics. You know why? Because they work. <laughs> They'll get us. So we've got to be careful. We're looking at it to be seen of men. They said, we built this altar to be seen. By the way, if you'll notice over in verse 26, look over there with me. It said, therefore, we said, let us now prepare to build us an altar. Not, watch this, not for burnt offering, nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between us and you that our generations after us, that we might do the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings and with our sacrifices and with our peace offerings, that your children may not say to our children in time to come, you have no part in the Lord. We want you to see what we've done here. Hey, we're going to have an altar, but there's going to be no sacrifice on it. There's going to be no burnt offerings on it. Let me tell you, that is totally, we're talking about taking God out of it. I could ask you this tonight. Do you have an altar of ed service to the Lord? Is it just to be seen? I mean, I have to ask myself that. I'm asking me that. We've got to be careful about this because if we want the power of God in our ministries, we can't put ourselves above the Lord. We've got to keep ourselves hum humble before God. And I want God to use me. I don't ever want to get a big head attitude. I've never got behind a pulpit that I know of that I haven't been scared to death to be here and nervous and say, God, I can't do this without you. I've not done it yet. And I don't ever want to get that way. I'm honest with you. I'm serious. Because I can't do it without him. And we can't do anything that we do without him. You have an altar of ed service to the Lord. This is a deceptive commitment that they've got. Are you doing what you're doing to be seen of men? That's what Ananias and Sapphira did. And they lied to the Holy Spirit. And God killed them. They did it to be seen. I mean, they, they hadn't done anything wrong until they said we sold it all. They didn't have to give anything. But to be seen of men, they said, hey, look at what we did. And you know... It was the husband that was killed first, and she come in later. Oh, praise the Lord, look at what we did. And Peter said, hey, you better quit talking like that. Where's my husband? Well, he's out right now. <laughs> and next thing you know, she's saying, hey, praise the Lord, look at what we gave. And just like that, he said, you lied to the Holy Ghost, and God killed you. To be seen of men. See, as our hearts need to be right with the Lord. Do you have an altar of ed commitment to the Lord? Do you have an altar of ed conversion in Christ? Now, here's the big one. There could be someone here tonight. You, you, listen, maybe you're playing. I don't know. I, I don't know. You're playing church. Listen, I got born again when I was 14, and I knew I was born again. God saved my soul. 
and, and he, he, he did something for me that nobody else could have done. He convicted me of my sin. He made me realize that there was no other way to get to heaven but through Jesus Christ. And I, as a 14-year-old boy, I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And he saved me that day. I didn't deserve that. I didn't deserve to be saved. I, I ought to be in a devil's hell right now. That's where I ought to be. That's where I deserve to be. And by the way, excuse me, that's where you deserve to be tonight. Amen. Amen. And except for the grace of God, that's where you would be tonight. But here's the thing. If you're playing the game, if you've just got an altar of Ed's salvation just to be seen, you know, did you know churches are filled with people that begin to come in and they start to learn how to sing the songs and they start to talk the talk and they, they begin to learn how to grow into it, but they've never been saved and we're living in a day when probably sometimes half, I'm talking about even sometimes good churches of people that have never been born again. Right. They've got an altar of Ed salvation. It's not genuine. It's, it's something to be seen, but it's not real in their lives. And I don't necessarily believe that's the way it is here, but listen, you've got to ask yourself that. Listen, you, that's why the Bible says make your calling and election sure. Don't doubt that. Hey, know that you're saved. Paul, Paul said, I know in whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him. The dangerous thing is to walk out of this building thinking that you've got religion or you've got some sort of a thing. You've done. Maybe you've been baptized. You know how many people, I mean, I'm talking about in Baptist churches that think because they got baptized, they got saved. They're going to die and go to hell believing that. And they got an altar of Ed salvation. Oh, listen, I've got it. Look at, look at me. I've got, I've, I want you to know I, I've done this or, or you know, because I pr preach uh, behind the pulpit or because I teach a Sunday school class or because I, I do whatever. That is not what's going to get you to heaven. It's only faith in Jesus Christ and through Amen. his blood. And he washes you from your sin and he births you into the family of God. I was, talking, I was talking to a young man not too long ago, and I said, you know what? He, he had been doubting his salvation, and I, and I said, you know, well, what he wanted was, what he wanted was, he kept always calling me, and he'd say, hey, how do I get the second blessing of the Spirit of God? And I know that's a kind of a Pentecostal thing, and I, so I kind of knew that. So I said, well, let me ask you this. Have you got the first blessing of the Spirit of God? And he said, well, what do you mean by that? I said, well, do you know that you've been born again? And I said, because when you get born again, you get all of the Holy Spirit you're going to get right then. And, he, and, what he, and he, really, he couldn't answer that. And I said, well, then you need to go and make sure you know the Lord. So I dealt with him that way. And I led him to the Lord over the phone, Brother Rob. And I hope he was sincere. He prayed like he was. Well... He, what he was thinking was, he was mixing up this thing of having the idea that if I get more of the Holy Spirit, now I can speak in tongues and I can have all these other gifts that they, they say you got. But what he was un misunderstanding was, hey, when you get saved, you're born again. You get the Holy Spirit. You're baptized into Christ by the Spirit of God right then. What you need is, is the Holy Spirit needs to have more of you. And that's the filling of the Spirit. And so finally, it kind of clicked on him. But the thing is, is there, that's one of 10 million examples of people that have an altar of Ed salvation, and they've never been born again. And we want to know why we don't have power, and we want to know why we don't. There's a lot of reasons for that, folks. But what I'm saying tonight is, hey, it's like this altar down here. This is altar is for show. This altar... Hey, and by the way, I've seen this too. I've never seen a church go down when people stay on this altar. Yeah. Now, when you dedicate this as an altar to the Lord, and not everybody comes down, that's fine. I'm not saying you need to. I'm saying if God speaks to your heart, you ought to come to this altar, get on your knees. Did you know an altar was, was a place of death? Yeah. And when you go to this altar, you're dying to self. Yeah. And there's something about getting on your knee before God and saying, Lord, and you begin to bring your petition to God on an altar. 
God does things at an altar. You see through the Bible, you'll see it happen. But it's not an altar bed. It's got to be something with the sacrifice on it. And it's got to be something with the fire on it. And it's got to be something that God is in. And you get a hold of God on it. Not just something to be seen of men. Right. Something that God is really working in your life. On. And you bring those petitions to the Lord. And you say, God, do this. And, and, my, and if you don't do it, it won't get done. And we pour our hearts out to Say, oh God, we need you. We want an altar of air. We want an altar that is hot and on fire, and God's going to do something on that altar. That's the altar we need tonight. Amen. Amen. Let me ask you this tonight. If you're here and you don't know for sure that you're saved, don't leave here with an altar of Ed salvation. If you're not sure you're saved, listen, there are people here and you say, well, man, that would be embarrassing. Listen. If there's somebody here and they'll walk the aisle, there's a there's hundred people in here that would walk the aisle with you tonight Amen. And, Amen. and stand right next to you, get on their knees and pray with you. Whatever it is, we'll have folks down here ready to take a Bible to show you how to be saved. Listen, don't leave here with an altar of Ed salvation. Don't leave here with an altar of Ed uh, c commitment to the Lord. Make sure it's right with God, not just to be seen, but your heart is right. Don't stop short of where God wants you to go. Watch out who you commune with. Watch out who you run with. Be careful because they can take you down. Father, we love you tonight. We're thankful for the word of God. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, that 